The abusively biased mainstream media, they continue to prove they're fundamentally incapable of covering President-elect Donald Trump fairly. Now, CNN, the Clinton News Network, they continually go after President-elect Trump. Just take a look at this report from Jeff Zeleny. Take a look. Donald Trump is showing signs tonight of being a sore winner. The president-elect is suggesting, with zero evidence to back up his claim, that he won the popular vote, and he's a victim of widespread election fraud. Is that fair and balanced? Now, President-elect Trump, he responded by retweeting criticisms of Zelani's report and then tweeted himself, quote, CNN is so embarrassed by their total 100% support of Hillary Clinton, and yet her loss and a landslide, they don't know what to do. And then later he added, quote, well, I thought that at CNN would get better after they failed so badly in their support of Hillary Clinton. However, since the election, they are worse. Now, it's important to remember that Jeff Zeleny, well, he's the same so-called journalist. Remember, he fawned over President Obama back in 2009. Remember this question back when he was working at the New York Times? Take a look. During these first 100 days, what has surprised you the most about this office, enchanted you the most about serving in this office, humbled you the most, and troubled you the most? Uh, let me write this down. <laughs> Surprised. Right, I've got, uh, troubled. I've got, uh, what, what was the first one? Surprised. Surprised. Troubled. Troubled. Enchanted. Enchanted. Nice. And humbled. And what was the last one? Humbled? Uh, humbled. Thank you, sir. Enchanted. Really? Now, he had the chance to ask the president a real question, and that's the one he picked. Now, Zelani, he's not alone over there at CNN. There's a lot of Trump bashing going on 24-7. Let's just take a quick look. This really speaks to incompetence. They can't even keep the president-elect from making a fool of himself on Twitter by saying that millions of people voted illegally. He looks foolish saying something like that. And well, it really is an unprecedented move. Donald Trump using his platform to question the integrity of the American election system. Now, as he heads home this evening, the president-elect is continuing one of his trademark Twitter tirades, blasting the effort to recount votes in some states. This was a white lash. This was a white lash against a changing country. It was a white lash against a black president in part. Wow, CNN looking pretty foolish. Now, I've been saying since 2008, journalism is dead, and those are only a few of the countless examples that prove it. But the liberal mainstream media, they're not interested in the truth or facts. They're all about pushing their radical left-wing agenda. What are they trying to do? Damage president-elect Donald Trump. Now, WikiLeaks exposed rampant collusion between the press and the Clinton campaign. So my question is, why should Donald Trump grant equal access to all of them? Now, in this day and age of social media, well, he doesn't need the press to connect with you, the American people. And as I said before, I think it's time to reevaluate the press and maybe change the traditional relationship with the press in the White House. For example, would President Obama allow 50 Sean Hannity's in the press pool asking him and his press secretary questions every single day? No, of course not. So my message tonight to the press is simple. You guys are done. You've been exposed as fake, as having an agenda, as colluding. You're a fake news organization. Here with Reaction, the editor-in-chief of Life Z, Fox News contributor, nationally syndicated radio talk show host Laura Ingram, and former White House Press Secretary Ari Fleischer. You know, there are rumors that Laura may be calling Ari for advice. Well, I'll move on. Um, <laughs> Ari, you wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal. Am I right about this? Does Donald Trump need the same dog and phony pony show to go on this, this cat and mouse game with a media that we know is biased, that was in the tank for Hillary Clinton? Why would CNN deserve a seat? in that media room at the White House? Well, the fact of the matter is the president and his team have latitude to make any number of changes in the way the White House press operation works. There are no laws that govern it. What governs it is tradition, some sense of mutual respect, which is really broken down. And so he can make huge changes. You know, I would counsel Sean not to go as far as you are going. I do think there's something to be gained by talking to the mainstream media and fighting with them and getting your points across. You know, good teams can win tough games on the road, and it's a road game when you deal with the mainstream media. But Is it I would a road game, though? But, I would bring... But what about all these organizations? CNN giving questions to Hillary Clinton. CNN exactly. seeking questions for the Republican nominee yeah. Look. from the DNC. Uh, CNBC, ABC, NBC, MSNBC. 
why? why? Why does he have to waste his time with people that we know don't like him and colluded with the other side? Why? Look, and this is, why, this is why I wrote the piece for the Wall Street Journal. There's a bigger, more broader, important point, and that is the American people have lost faith in the pr press. According to the Gallup poll, trust in the press to report news accurately and fairly is at an all-time low. According to the Pew poll, only 5% of the American people have a great deal of confidence in the media. The press has lost the very people it needs to rely on, to read them, to view them, and to keep the president in check. And yeah. so the press has brought this on itself, and I think Donald Trump would be smart to diversify the press, bring in different groups of people, foreign reporters, business writers. I'd love to see one day, Sean, liberalandconservative.coms in the briefing room together Interesting. asking the questions. What do you think, Laura? Sean, I think you should be in the briefing room every day. I'd love that. I'd love you <laughs> asking questions, tough questions. Well, look, I think Ari has a point. I, I'm not sure I'd throw it all away and say, oh, we're not going to do these briefings anymore. But I, I do think when it comes to reporting, real straight reporting, there are networks, and I think you named one, CNN, Sean, that is so far in the tank for the Democrats, so far in the tank for political correctness. You know how, you know how pathetic they are? I just got an email from some ki kid, who I guess is a reporter for CNN, who went to Dartmouth College to go through old copies of the Dartmouth Review to, like, you know, write a, write a piece on, or do a piece, I don't know, on, on like what I wrote about as editor of the Dartmouth Review 30-plus years ago. <laughs> I mean, this is, I'm like, yeah, I also short-sheeted kids' beds at camp, okay, yeah, I mean, it's like Well, they did that to Romney, who was a bully in high school, remember that back in 2012? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're dispatching reporters to interview professors in their 80s that I wrote columns about. I mean, this is what it is. This, we have all these problems with ISIS and immigration. They're going back to, like, Dartmouth Library. It's the funniest thing Laura, about it. your mean, life is one of great interest. The country needs to know. Oh this is God. pivotal what you did it's back hilarious. in Dartmouth. He's like, I want to talk to you on the record. I'm like, no, I only talk to real news organizations. Go ahead. Do you think, Laura, though, that there might be a benefit if you colluded to such a high level, I'll use CNN as an example, you don't get that seat back. As a matter of course, you know, Ari's talking about tradition, but that tradition has changed. The media landscape has changed. Their relevance is greatly diminished, and I would argue most people do not get their, their news from those sources any longer, and maybe it's time to, to reevaluate all of this. Well, I think it's, it's within uh, Trump's purview. I think Ari's right. Trump, can, Trump sets the rules and the way he wants the press operation to work. I haven't really given it much thought. I think, I think people have gotten so smart and so hip to what they're doing that it's a bunch of white noise coming. And, and I'm not saying that all the, all the folks over at CNN are bad, bad people or there's some good reporters. I think there are, and there's some really fair reporters there. But, I mean, th the kind of stuff they're doing, the kind of little games they're playing are yeah. so transparent that they're either going to just... You know, they're the they're the fake news organizations. I mean, it's funny, right? Dot, yeah, a lot of the dot coms are just like commentary sites and cultural sites. They're not they're not pretending to be news organizations, but there are some news organizations that are are basically operating as Hillary yeah. or Democrat super PACs. Uh, last word, Ari. Let me give you an example. This is how the bias works, and it bothers me. When President Obama was elected, the press widely reported historic win because he's African American. Hillary, if she had won, it would have been historic first woman. Where are the stories saying historic win by Donald Trump, first outsider? The press largely sees things through the filter of the Democrat and liberal lens, which is race identity, identity politics, and liberal points of view. They hurt themselves when they do that, distance themselves from the American people, because there are so few conservatives and people who see things through a Republican lens in the media. And that's their biggest problem, and that's why they tilt, and that's why they're biased. Well said. All right, guys. Thank you both. Appreciate it. By the way, Laura's new website, LifeZet, is uh, doing very well. Thank you. Thanks so much. Another very busy day for the president-elect. Mr. Trump meeting with more potential nominees for his cabinet, including three contenders for secretary of state. Developments on that just ahead. But first, to the two major appointments today. Our sources say the president-elect has chosen Elaine Chao, a former labor secretary head, I'm sorry, from the labor secretary to head the transportation department. But the bigger news is a selection for health and human services secretary. He picked Georgia Congressman Dr. Tom Price, a fierce critic of Obamacare, who, if confirmed, will likely help him dismantle the disastrous health care law. Democrats, 
are already voicing outrage about the selection. Here's some reaction from the White House. So the president-elect has chosen to um, nominate someone to be his Secretary of Health and Human Services who is an ardent opponent of the Affordable Care Act uh, and somebody who says he is committed to repealing it. That the only kinds of ideas that have been put forward by the Republicans, to the extent that they've put forward any ideas, and there have not been many, but when they have, they actually have been ideas for undermining the law, not strengthening it. Uh, okay. Their promise to change it, I think, is going to be challenging. All right, Casey, why does this come as a surprise to Democrats? They knew the Donald Trump uh, nominee, Donald Trump candidate, Donald Trump said if he won, he was going to dismantle and take apart and maybe repeal and replace Obamacare. Dr. Price, an opponent of, of Obamacare yeah. and has even floated his own alternative to Obamacare. Well, it sounds like somebody really prepared, shovel ready to be able to go in there and head the department and get things done. This is one of the things that uh, the president-elect promised that he would do to his supporters uh, as he campaigned across the country, that he was going to do something to repeal and replace Obamacare. Then we saw that he met with President Obama, who is, by all accounts, quite charming, and talked to him. So maybe they're surprised because they thought maybe he would, you know, walk it back, not do it. He agreed about two things that he was going to do. But it's in the Republican plan as well. So we're going to have to see what his specific ideas are and if that comports with, obviously, what President-elect Trump wants to do. What do you do. think? Why, why, why the surprise on, on the left? Well, I think that the surprise is that this is not someone who has any interest in sort of maintaining a health insurance program not only for people who are poor who are covered in large part by Obamacare but it goes beyond that to things like Medicare and Medicaid and programs that benefit our soldiers mm -hmm. so it allows people to opt out his basic idea Eric is that you should go away from a basic entitlement and make it income sensitive a, a, t a tax credit so it's a tax credit right. or a tax deduction he said a tax credit, but it, you have to earn enough to qualify Not if it's a for. Credit. Yeah, you have to earn a enough. A, du a deduction, you have to earn enough. Yes. A tax credit. A tax can, credit, you, you still have to have. Not so have to earn enough. Well, the poor would not be because they wouldn't be able to get. Of course they to could. Generate it. Of course they could. That's the that's the difference between a tax cut or tax um, um, deduction and a tax and a credit. credit. If you don't pay taxes and you get a tax credit, you actually get government government sub uh, subsidy. I agree that it's going to be difficult. I mean, it's, a, it's an uphill challenge because President Obama baked the law so far into the system that it will be difficult to dismantle it, but it's not impossible. And Dr. Price, one of the things that he's done is um, introduced a bill that was solely, faci solely focused on patients, the mm -hmm. Empowering Patients First Act. And I think Thank that you. that approach would be very welcome for people who supported Donald Trump and beyond, because what it is saying is that we know, remember that study out of Oregon that showed that people on Medicaid had worse health outcomes than people who did not, than before they even were on Medicaid. So what it's saying is that you, it's sort of like school choice. It's like you, person, a citizen of the United States, maybe you don't make enough to get a tax deduction, but we could give you a tax credit, and if you want to shop around and you don't want to have to have Medicaid, and in your state you can shop around for, for different places where you could get better care for your family, it's a radical, radically different approach, and I know, Juan, that one that... Um, I agree. When I mean, you're shaking your head, it's going to be difficult, yeah, it's but tough. it's not impossible. So I'm very sensitive to you on this point because I think you've told me personally that this has created a tremendous headache for you. Which one? Obamacare. Obamacare? Oh, yeah, personally? Right. Okay. right. So I, I always think, well, gee, <laughs> what is it? What's How the difference help? here? And my <laughs> sense of it is that something, even what Eric says, that, that the tax credit would benefit because it's a subsidy. But, you know, you know what, the way I think of it is... What you're saying is to people in many cases that the tax credit wouldn't even be enough to ke the ke uh, cover your deductible. Can I jump in here? Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Who are you? I, my name's Greg. Hey. I usually sit here in the corner. Nice um, to see this, this, here's the big problem. When you're taking out the trash, people still see you as taking something away. Correct. And that is the problem with a government program yes. that is horrible. People still th say, but it's already there. How dare you take it away? Well, the problem is it's yeah. health spending is 17% of our GDP. It's a difference in philosophy. You have a guy named Price who believes in real growth. 
as opposed to a government program with, which is fake growth. When a government pro program gets bigger, it simply gets bigger and costlier. But if you actually put something in private enterprise, like when you're talking about health medical savings accounts, which he's for, mm -hmm. Then, if the program grows, so does the economy. Everybody gets wealthier. People mm -hmm. get more jobs. That doesn't happen with something like Obamacare. It is nothing more than a program that survives on its own self getting bigger. It, the economy itself doesn't get bigger. That's why it's bad. That's why, you're, we, that's why he hired, um, or he's, he's putting forth price in this uh, Seema Verma, who is dealing with uh, um, Medicare, and, and she's a health industry expert, to understand this transition, to know for a fact that liberals and Democrats are going to say you're an awful person for getting rid of this program. You have two people there that are saying, no, here's the transition. Here's what we're going to do. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Can I clarify something, though, yeah. guys? Because when he said that I've had problems with Obamacare, the problems I've had have, are, are not about having access to care. I, obviously, I'm in a position where I can be able to afford it. Our problem has been that you have a changing system. Like every six months, you find out that the insurer that you have is no longer going to be covered in Manhattan. So you've got to find another one. Then you find out that the doctor that you wanted doesn't take that insurance anymore, etc. So what, he's, what I'm talking about in terms of these uh, tax credits are for people that might want to have a different or better system and not have to be on the government And, and, yeah. and the program. beauty of it, I'm sorry, Juan, but the beauty of it is it removes the mandate. The mandate is a part of Obamacare <laughs> okay. that, peop that people that, you know, this is people so have such a huge problem with. I, well, why, I think some why conservatives, no, this, some conservatives This actually allows it. someone with, with a low, low income to no income to take mm -hmm. a tax credit and go shop and get good health care, <laughs> yeah. not just be... And they don't have enough, it. and it's mm -hmm. not large enough to cover even the deductible, which was my earlier point. But here's the thing. Let me just give you what I think is, is Tom Price's heart and soul. And it comes back to something Greg was talking about. Tom Price says government should not be involved right, exactly. with health care. Right. And we should get them out and health care should be up to you, mm -hmm. individual citizen, Miss Dana Perino. Free market. Right? Free yeah. market. But, the, but what is his proposal? <laughs> what is his proposal? His proposal is give it as a block grant to the states. And the states then can determine eligibility. And in some cases, he doesn't even he, he doesn't even consider anything like income. So I read, read today, one guy said, Bill Gates, under Tom Price's plan, would get the maximum benefit. But a kid under 18, he would be limited. And that kid might have greater needs, let's say, than <coughs> the billion. Well, that was a Bill plan Gates. proposed in 2009. This that's, is it, next... that's his proposal. Okay, right. But nevertheless, he's going to have to put together a plan that the president-elect would also agree with. So... Yes, he's somebody who didn't just complain uh, about Obamacare. He came forward with his own ideas and solution. That's positive to begin with. And now what you do is you go back in and learn from what we saw about the pitfalls of Obamacare <clears throat> and make some positive changes so that it's comprehensive reform that actually works. Well, let's it's, gonna end up, yeah. it's all going to end up in the middle. We all know this. It's not going to be purely you know, private, free market solutions with no government Involvement and it's not going to be all government. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. And it's but the thing, first thing you got to do is you got to fix or get rid of a yeah, problem. Well, yeah, chair of the budget committee, so he knows numbers. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I this guy had a lot, of, a lot of alternatives. Yeah. He, he focused on lawsuit abuse, on medical savings accounts, slush funds. He had it all there. And, and by the way, this has to go through Congress as well if you're right. going to eliminate Obamacare and bring something else. So it, he has to work with Congress to come up with an alternative that's acceptable. To, to the Senate and Congress. I'm I, mean, all, I agree you, with that. You're taking something that, I he, agree with he, that. he floated seven years ago right. as an alternative just to something that was you. a disaster. No, you, it's not perfect, but it's it, certainly better than what we have. You guys say, oh, you know, he, there's nothing wrong with him. Why is Josh Ernest lamenting him? Why is Chuck Schumer, who's the incoming minority Can guy? Can yeah. we listen to that? Uh, Chuck Schumer, incoming Chuck Schumer. Senate minority leader Chuck Schumer is also voicing his disapproval of the price pick for HHS. Listen. I was just so disappointed to see the president-elect nominate Congressman Price to serve as Secretary of Health and Human Services this morning. When it comes to issues like Medicare, the Affordable Care Act, and Planned Parenthood, Congressman Price and the average American couldn't be further apart. There are a whole number of Republicans who uh, are not going to be for privatizing Medicare, and there ought to be bipartisan support against a secretary who's going to privatize Medicare and not fund Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. right, go ahead, Juan. You're mm -hmm. sorry. The, the this, you were this, on. Okay, so I was going to say, why is he saying that? Why is Nancy Pelosi saying families are going to get left out in the cold? 20 they million scare people. Seniors. 
No, no, I think, I think, but I think seniors will be scared legitimately because, you know what, people like Medicare in this country. Mm -hmm. People yeah. like Social Security. This is Greg's point. It exists, and it's hard to say, I'm going to take this away but from you. But that's not what Trump has said. What, oh, go and ahead. So I think that President-elect Trump has said that he would actually, uh, would not do anything to take money away from the current Social Security um, system, which actually rankles some on the far right, who has been like, oh, well, we can't really afford that. But I think D Dr. Price is not going to go to HHS and then all of a sudden not be connected to Donald Trump's policy No, but, but, but remember that Paul Ryan, the speaker, has said he would like to privatize Medicare. Parts right? of it, yes. yes. Why are you <laughs> smiling? <laughs> because, because this is what the yeah. Democrats... Oh. I, don't ex I don't think that there is anyone that Donald Trump would put forward for HHS secretary that Schumer and Pelosi would not say that about. Correct. They've been dining out on the health care issue for so long. But I think that they have to keep in mind after President Obama went forward with a partisan plan on Obamacare, he then lost congressional seats in 2012, 2014, and 2016. There is a pattern here, and they have a chance to fix it. Eighty percent of people polled at the election said they thought that Obamacare needed to be fixed. Yeah. So if Donald Trump's willing to come to the table and you have yeah. someone like Tom Price, why not take a chance and see if, if there's a, ch a way to make it more affordable and bend the cost curve down like because they said? And a guy with a budget background. He took over from Paul Ryan as chairman of the budget. So, like, I think this is good. I'm looking forward well, to I it. Well, I just think it's Probably. demolition derby, and this guy's a darling of the insurance industry. That's what uh, he is. Oh. What? Oh. How dare you? Oh. Yeah. You know what he's he's a a I'm a darling of the insurance Well, yeah. He's you a darling the of getting government out of the health care <laughs> business, of which he's going to oversee. you got to love that. Yeah, That's yeah. draining the swamp right there. All right, don't forget, <laughs> oh Vice President-elect Mike Pence is on Hannity tonight. I just bumped into him. I spoke to him for a few minutes. What a great guy. This is a must-see interview. You're going to love that one. Remember when Donald Trump said during the campaign that if he won, he would be so presidential, you'll be bored? Well, I'm not bored yet. He seems to be using the same aggressive style that he did as a candidate. And the president-elect now, again, using Twitter to go after the media to fire up controversies. The latest example, of course, has to do with this joke of a Jill Stein recount, which is going forward in Wisconsin. It's going to go nowhere. Everybody knows that. And she's pushing it in other states as well. And, you know, the way I'm describing it is the idea of a Green Party candidate who got almost no votes pushing a recount was treated by the media initially as kind of a two-alarm fire, when it deserved to be treated as, I would say, a dumpster fire. But then Trump got on Twitter, attacked Hillary Clinton for having her campaign at least cooperate. She didn't initiate uh, this recount effort. Uh, and then when Trump uh, dropped the bomb on Twitter saying, well, I would have won the popular vote, not that it matters, he's got 306 electoral votes, uh, if millions of people hadn't voted illegally, every news organization on the planet then said there is no evidence of that. Donald Trump is making unsubstantiated charges. And now it's a forest fire raging out of control. It's a major media issue. And Trump, the latest twist on this is Trump reacted to that with a tweet storm against CNN. Everybody knows he doesn't have exactly a high opinion of CNN. And he went after the CNN reporter Jeff Zeleny, who reported on this, not only saying like everybody else that there was no evidence, but I think saying that Donald Trump was acting like a sore winner. And so Delaney is a former New York Times correspondent. He's no lightweight, but Trump was retweeting what some of his followers were saying, saying, um, Jeff Zeleny, just another generic CNN part-time wannabe journalist. Another one said, uh, you have no sufficient ev evidence, Zeleny, that Donald Trump did not suffer from voter fraud. Shame. Bad reporter. Well, so now CNN and everybody else is in the position of having to prove a negative uh, that uh, Trump didn't suffer from millions of people voting illegally. By the way, the guy won. So it's a little hard for me to understand why he is pushing this. I know he probably got ticked off at CNN's coverage. CNN hasn't commented. Zeleny went on Twitter to say uh, he's looking for examples of voter fraud and he's a full-time journalist working. Uh, and then just as, the, as this was heating up, uh, Trump, seemingly out of the blue, but it turns out not exactly, um, fired off this tweet about a flag burning. I mean, he believes that flag burners should either go to jail or be stripped of their citizenship. It turns out there was a Fox report around the same time about an incident in which students at a Massachusetts college uh, had burned the flag in protest of Trump's election and that some veterans were coming to protest that. Um, look, I'm sure most Americans feel the way I do. I hate flag burning. It makes me really angry. But at the same time, there is a constitutional right to do that, the whole point of the First Amendment is to protect unpopular speech, and the Supreme Court ruled on this in 1989. So I don't know if the president is going to make a serious 
push about this, by the way, Hillary Clinton a decade ago said she'd like to introduce legislation or supported legislation for some kind of jail term for flag burning, but it does run into these constitutional questions. The bottom line here is, whether he's talking about voter fraud, flag burning, CNN, you name it, Donald Trump has 16 million Twitter followers, and he's got this giant megaphone in that we all react, we in the media all react to just about everything he puts on Twitter. Therefore, day after day after day, and it's the same thing whether it's, you know, Mitt Romney or David Petraeus or Rudy for Secretary of State, he is setting, he is framing the debate. He is driving the media agenda. And while many, you know, uh, you know, establishment journalists may clear their throats and say, this simply is not how it's done, the, the, the transition is chaos, it, we're just not used to this. A guy who got elected president by being aggressive on Twitter uh, and on the air and through his public statements and sticking it to the media. We have to figure out how to cover him as president-elect, as president, uh, and we also need to challenge him when he says things that aren't true. But at the moment, he is essentially dictating every day's headlines, and I suspect that Donald Trump likes it that way.